Hey everyone, ready for another deep dive? Always. Awesome. Today we're going way back uh, to the 1920s. Oh, wow. To the forests of Washington State. Okay. We've got two excerpts from the Murillette. Oh, cool. Which, for those who don't know, was a scientific journal. Right. It was all about Northwestern bird life. Neat. And these excerpts are from 1925. So what we're going to be looking at today is some really cool wildlife sightings. Sounds fun. Yeah. First up are California gray squirrels. Oh, fun. And these observations are from a naturalist named Theo H. Sheffer. Got it. He found their nests uh -huh. way up high in young fir trees. Wow, wow. Like 25 to 40 feet off the ground. That's pretty high up. Can you imagine you head... trying to find those? So high. But there was a good reason for these squirrels. Um, What's that? To choose to live so high up. Yeah, why? Back then, hollow trees were really scarce in that area. Oh, so they didn't have as many options. Yeah, exactly. Cause... So tell me, what did these nests look like? Well, picture this. A sturdy platform of twigs. Mm-hmm all carefully woven together. Wow. And then inside, yeah. it's lined with soft moss and shredded bark. Oh, that sounds really cozy. And get this. Okay. There's a hidden entrance. Like a secret squirrel hideaway. Exactly. They were serious about their privacy, huh? I guess so. Imagine all that way up in a tree. And having to build it. And keep it maintained, yeah. Because they're exposed to the elements year round. Oh yeah, for sure. It's really incredible. It is, yeah. Okay, so from sky high squirrel nests, we're moving on to... On a different kind of nest. This one sounds more like a buffet. A buffet. You'll see what I mean. All right. So this account comes from another naturalist, D.E. Brown. Okay. And he discovered a Kennecott's screech owl nest. Oh, cool. Where was it? In a decayed fir stump mm. right next to a busy road in Seattle. Whoa, that's not exactly what I picture for an owl's home. I know, right? <laughs> Talk about city living. Definitely not peaceful and quiet. Hmm. Well, Brown found two fluffy owlets inside, oh. but alongside them, yeah. the remains of three northern violet green swallows okay. and three English sparrows. Whoa. Quite the variety. So they weren't just eating, like, city scraps. I guess not. It makes you wonder how it caught all those birds in such a busy place. Yeah, right in the city. It really shows how adaptable they are. It does. They're not picky eaters, and they're clearly not afraid to make a home just about anywhere. So we've got squirrels building high-rise apartments in the trees. Yeah. And owls setting up shop in city stumps. It's amazing. Both these observations are from a century ago. Right? But I bet there are some parallels to how these animals live today, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. What's so fascinating is how their resourcefulness and adaptability just shines through. Totally. It's like, and no matter what challenges they face, they figure out a way to make things work. Exactly. They find safe places to nest, uh -huh. and they figure out how to get food. Even in a bustling city. And there's a whole lot more to uncover about these crafty creatures. There is. Oh, yeah. Well, in that case... In the next part of our deep dive... Okay. We'll explore those details and see what other surprises these observations from the past hold. Sounds good. I can't wait. You know what's really cool about these observations? What's that? They're not just about squirrels and owls. Yeah. They're a window into how these animals adapted. Oh, I see. To it... the changes brought on by humans. That's a good point. I mean, think about all the development in yeah. the Pacific Northwest over the last century. It's crazy how much things have changed. It's amazing. Are you all right? That they're still here. Yeah, they're still around. Making a home for themselves oh. in this changing landscape. It really is amazing. And it's not just about yeah. finding a physical space to live. Oh. It's also about adapting their behaviors. Okay. Remember how Sheffer described the squirrel nests? Yeah, how they were perfectly dry inside. Even during the rainy season. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's not easy to do. No kidding. I struggle to keep my apartment dry sometimes. Really? And I don't even have to worry about rain coming in through the roof. Well, imagine having to build your own roof. Out of twigs and moss. Exactly. That's some serious construction work. They had to think like engineers. It's like squirrel architecture. Yeah, considering things like drainage and insulation. To make sure those nests could handle anything. It makes you wonder if they had some <laughs> kind of secret squirrel handbook. A blueprint. Yeah, like squirrel nest building for dummies. That's funny. But in a way, yeah. they did have a blueprint. 
What's that? Their instincts honed over mm. generations, wow. guiding them to choose the right materials uh -huh. and build those sturdy structures. That's amazing. Like their DNA was programmed for survival. Yeah, even in a changing world. And it's not just the squirrels. Oh, right. The owl nest. Remember. The one with the feathers. Lined with feathers. That's another example. It is. Of how these animals used what was available yeah. to create a comfortable home. And functional, too. Oh, yeah, of course. And it was right in the city. Right. Makes you wonder if those owlers were thinking. Like, hey, there might be some good eating around here. Seriously. Like a city buffet. I mean, finding food in a city can be tough. Yeah. But they figured it out. And it wasn't just any food? Nope. A whole variety of birds. Another sign of their adaptability. Totally. They weren't limited to just one type of food. No, they took advantage of any opportunity. Like what? They're reading the City Living for Wildlife guidebook. Huh. So we've got squirrels building weatherproof penthouses. Yeah. And owls becoming urban foodies. It's a wild world it's, out there. It is. What can we learn from these observations? I think oh. the biggest takeaway is and the resilience of nature. Absolutely. Even facing all these human-induced changes. Yep. They found ways to adapt. And fraught. It makes you think. If they can do it, uh -huh. maybe we can learn something from them. Like what? Maybe we can be more adaptable. Yeah. More resourceful. And more in yeah. tune with our surroundings. Totally. There's a lot we can learn yeah. from observing the natural world. Right. And in the final part of our deep dive, okay. we'll explore some of those lessons right. and see how we can apply them to our own lives. Sounds good. <laughs> I'm ready. Okay, so we're back. Back for more squirrels and owls. And ready to wrap up okay. this deep dive. Cool. Into those amazing observations. From the 1920s. Yeah, the 1920s. It really makes you think. About what? How much our world has changed since then. Oh, yeah. Especially with all the... Uh, Development. Yeah, all the cities and towns okay. that have popped up everywhere. The Pacific Northwest has definitely seen... I know, right? ...a lot of development. Over the past century. And while we've been talking about... Yeah. ...how adaptable these animals are... Huh? It's good to remember... What's that? ...that their resilience has limits. Oh, right, of course. Even yeah. the most resourceful squirrel... Yeah. ...can only handle... So much. So much change. Exactly. It really makes you wonder uh, how they're doing today. Oh, yeah. With all the, you know. All of the challenges. Yeah, all the challenges. Well, we can't travel forward in time. I wish we could. To see how these specific animals did. That would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. The bigger picture. Right. What are some of the things <laughs> that researchers are finding out? Oh, there are tons <laughs> of species that are figuring out. Like what? City life. For adapting <laughs> to urban environments. And not just squirrels and owls. Oh, okay. There are some birds that are changing their songs. Wow. What? So they can be heard over traffic noise. That's so cool. And some plants, yeah. they're evolving really? to tolerate higher levels of pollution. That's incredible. It's like they're rewriting their survival guide. They are in real time. Wow. But it's important to remember. What's that? Not all species are. As adaptable. Exactly. Oh, man. So what can we do? To help. Yeah, to help. Well, besides yeah. not building cities on top of every forest. Uh -huh. Exactly. Well, we can be more mindful okay. of how our actions impact wildlife. We can support sustainable development. Right. Create green spaces in cities yeah. or even just plant native plants in our yards. So even small changes can make a difference. They can, yeah. That's good. There's actually a growing movement. Oh, really? To make cities more welcoming. For who? For wildlife, like what? Rooftop gardens, wildlife corridors, and even I've heard of those bird friendly buildings. That's so cool. It's like we're finally realizing my, that my, oh, uh, we can read, cool. share our spaces uh -huh. with other creatures, yeah, instead of just pushing them out. Exactly. And by studying those creatures, yeah. like our squirrels and owls, yeah, we can learn so much about what about how to live sustainably. Okay. And in harmony with nature. I really love that. Okay. So as we wrap up this deep dive, okay. I hope you're feeling hopeful. I am. Good. Yeah, those observations from the 1920s, mm -hmm. they reminded us of nature's ability. It's pretty incredible. To adapt. It is. And how that same resilience yeah. is still happening today. It really is. In our modern world. You know, yeah. just like those naturalists. From a century ago. We can all contribute. To what? A better future okay. for humans and wildlife. 
by paying attention. Learning and yeah. taking action. Couldn't have said it better myself. So yeah. to all our listeners out there. Keep exploring. Stay curious. And remember that even small actions can make a big difference. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive.